In the 21st century, the music industry feels like such a monolithic figure that it's difficult to picture our current musical landscape without it. For example, could you really picture modern music without the concept of an album? Though the album began as a way to categorize pieces, the introduction of records and subsequently their limitations affected the way that artists wrote music, with many adjusting their methods to specifically fit the format. And what about music videos? With the addition of visual aesthetics to modern music, the last 50 years or so of pop music has shown artists viewing their videos not only as promotional tools, but important pieces of their art. Let's stick with that example of music videos. Have you ever considered where they came from? What about how their development is related to the invention of stereo sound? And what links both of these concepts to Disney? As you can see in the video title, it's Fantasia. One, two, three, three, to be on the move, to go for a hike or whatever you like to do. When The Jazz Singer was released in 1927, it ushered in a new era of film due to its usage of synchronized sound. However, the first cartoon with sound was actually published earlier. Inkwell Studios published the first of Max Fleischer's song cartoons, series in 1926, called My Old Kentucky Home. Despite not technically being the first film with sound, The Jazz Singer introduced sound in a more tangible way, being a full-length feature film that used a sound system called the Vitaphone to record and synchronize both audio and music. This was different from My Old Kentucky Home. Home, a cartoon that had a soundtrack playing throughout and only had light amounts of synchronization. Walt Disney would eventually be inspired by synchronized sound and released Steamboat Willie in 1928. Though it was not the first cartoon with sound, Steamboat Willie got the most out of synchronized sound technology through clever gags and extensive detail. Steamboat Willie would make Mickey Mouse a national celebrity, but this popularity didn't last forever. In 1936, Walt began brainstorming ways to revitalize the cartoon character's popularity. This led to the development of a cartoon called The Sorcerer's Apprentice that featured both Mickey and the famous orchestral piece by Paul Dukas. Disney had already been experimenting with classical music and cartoons through its Silly Symphony series, but he wanted this new short to have a strong narrative and go beyond the typical slapstick approach for cartoons. It's worth noting that Disney was also developing Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs during this time, so it makes sense that he was looking to create cartoons that had more narrative substance. Disney would approach the famous conductor Leopold Stokowski to record the music for the short. After Stokowski was brought on board and they recorded the music for the source his apprentice in 1937, Disney asked him to extend his contract to cover a new film that would be called The Concert Feature. The title would eventually be changed to Fantasia after company members offered their input. After a selection process, the Disney team curated a set of classical music pieces and animated scenarios to create a film with. With Fantasia, Disney wanted to create a new sound system that would help immerse the audiences in the music. Because there would be no dialogue in the film, Disney wanted the music to engage the audience to portray the narrative. You also have to keep in mind that up until this moment, audio recordings were mainly monophonic, preventing you from hearing a lot of the nuance involved with music. For example, any orchestral concert has a large number of ensemble members scattered throughout a room, with their specific placements changing how the audience hears the sound, but all of this nuance is condensed when recorded. David Sarnoff and William Garrity would help create Fantasound, the first stereophonic surround sound system that was specifically used for Fantasia. In an article from the 1941 issue of the Journal of the Society of Motion Picture Engineers, Garrity, along with John Hawkins, explained how the system worked in its development. Please forgive me for the simplification, but if you want to read the entire article for yourself, I'll be linking to it in the description. The invention of Fantasound began with the instruction to make a sound move across the screen. It was discovered that by fading through two speakers that were 20 feet apart, they could create the illusion that the sound source was moving. This opened up a door for creating auditory immersion by allowing Disney to design sound in a way that was more three-dimensional than previous recording technologies. One of the early uses for this relationship in developing Fantasound was through something referred to as the pan pod. By by having three speakers and fading certain sounds between them, Disney can make sounds move with the direction of elements in the animation. In other words, an object moving from left to right on a screen could not be represented by sound due to having speakers, specifically horns, that can make a specific sound begin on the left and move to the right. Another part of Fantasound was the usage of the Tone Operating Gain Adjusting Device, also referred to as TOGAD. 
This device was itself comprised of two main components, the variable gain amplifier and the tone rectifier. To greatly simplify them, the variable gain amplifier was used to regulate the loudness of the main three audio tracks, and the tone rectifier helped filter certain frequencies while also converting the electricity to be compatible with the setup. The exact setup of Fantasound varied a great deal as they continued to develop the system, but this typically resulted in a minimum of five different horns around a theater surrounding the audience. Depending on the amount of nuance that you wanted, this could even contain up to eight horns at a time. As you can imagine, this was an incredibly complicated and expensive system. For this reason, the recording the recording and sound production process of Fantasia took up almost a fifth of the film's entire budget. The extravagance of Fantasound was both the reason for its success and its eventual failure. When Fantasound was brought on a roadshow theatrical release, it was only able to be presented in 13 theaters due to budget and technological constraints. Each Fantasound system cost $85,000 to set up, meaning that Disney would have to just about break the bank to get the film out to audiences in the way that they originally intended to. In a later article, William Garrity and Watson Jones articulate five things that made Fantasound not work on the road. One, the amount of equipment required and the time necessary to make the installation. Two, because of the time element, attractive theaters were not available, as the first class houses in the various communities had established policies and the installation of the equipment would generally require darkening the house for a few days. Three, the advent of wartime conditions precluded the possibility of developing mobile units that would have lessened installation time and costs. Four, the variation in the regulations throughout the country, both as to operating personnel and local ordinances, materially affected the operating and installation costs. Five, Space factors of the projection room in particular were problems of major importance. Even though the specialized Fantasound system was not able to be spread widely, it still had a huge impact on the entertainment industry. Fantasia would go on to be the first film to ever present some type of surround sound system, introducing the idea of stereo and forever changing the way that we view sound. It would still be a while before the idea of stereo would be commercially available enough for a majority of musicians to experiment with it, but the introduction of stereo did affect the way that musicians wrote. Instead of having to game the system with methods like Phil Spectre, wall of sound, musicians could place different instruments in multiple channels. So there you have it. As the first film to feature stereo sound, Fantasia had a significant influence on music history. The ways in which sound is affected by the medium and social context that it's presented in can't be overstated. Perhaps it isn't best to have compositional possibilities dictated by format limits or commercial reception. However, I think to not acknowledge the positive effects of Fantasound and similarly innovative technologies would be missing the point, as they paved the way for far more than simply the commercial film industry. In other words, Fantasound helped recorded music become a traveling art form and eventually brought the nuance of an orchestral concert to the average person's home. No ticket required.